be on the SARS-CoV YouTube. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, okay, so without further ado, um, SARS-CoV, uh, of course, uh, supports authentic science and engineering experiences for teachers and students pre-K through 12 across the state of Arizona. So we are super excited to uh, host Katie Prudick, uh, today, who is an entomologist at the University of Arizona. I have to give a tiny bit of backstory that I met Katie when she was a graduate student and I was a high school teacher and she uh, mentored one of my students in um, uh, aposomatic coloration and predation in praying mantis, mantises. Yes, I believe so. And I think that that mentee now works for Greenpeace just as a little update or did a couple of years ago which is kind of cool. But Katie is um, an assistant professor of um, and, and works in the um, environment and natural resources uh, department or school. Is it a school? School, okay. And um, she works in citizen and data science. She is the co-director of eButterfly, which is an online global um, community science resource for butterfly enthusiasts. So please welcome Katie, thank you. Oh, thank you, Margaret, for the kind words. And thank you, Rebecca, too, for all your organizational work with this. It's amazing. Um, I'm so glad to be here, folks. Uh, as Margaret mentioned, I'm an assistant professor over in the School of Natural Resources, and I study butterfly conservation and how we can help butterflies and other pollinators in a quickly changing world. Um, so a bit of conservation and management. So I made this talk pretty informally. So please feel free, given that we're in sort of like a small group environment, to turn on your camera and ask questions. You know, just like raise your hand and I'm happy to take questions during the during my presentation. And I'll be monitoring the chat as well. Um, and again, this is designed really to communicate information and, um, you know, kind of scratch that intellectual itch that you may have about uh, community science and the, what, where the data goes, because it's an interesting, question. So I'm going to share my screen. Oh, oh. let's see. No, nope. I want a slideshow. There we go. Uh, that's great. All right. So I'm going to be talking today about community science. Um, specifically, I focus mostly on pollinators. So I'm going to give you an information, sort of information, how the science, how that data is being used in the pollinator world, but it does sort of translate out to how it's being used in other areas of biodiversity like birds or even things like mosquitoes, which I would consider more of a pest concern, invasive species, those sorts of things. So a lot of the methodology is very similar. So, okay. uh, you know, but yes. before we continue, there's a box that's in front of part of your- Oh slide. yes, let me move so that over here. That is you guys. Yeah. Let's see, is that better? Yeah. Let's move you over here. Okay, so as such, okay. I'm going to have a hard time seeing people, so you're going to have to talk. Yep. I'll let you know uh, if, if somebody raises a hand or Perfect. Okay. okay. So we're going to talk about insects, and as you've probably heard, they're not doing great. Specifically, pollinators um, are having a hard time, and other aquatic insects such as mayflies, stoneflies, are, and dragonflies are also you know, experiencing pretty big declines. Uh, globally. So this isn't just in the in the US or even North America, this is pretty much around the world and of particular concern in the tropics. So, but I do want to remind everybody that at least when we look throughout the uh, evolutionary history um, through geologic time, so long periods of time, is it's actually insects do pretty well. They tend not to go extinct even during during mass extinctions. And so we can look, you know, the Devonian wasn't great, but certainly during the Triassic and then of course the KT that took out the dinosaurs, the, the insects did okay um, by and large. So this is not necessarily a death sentence uh, for insects at large. Um, and, you know, insects are really cool. So they, they expect a fast evolutionary response. And that has to do with how they make a living and respond to catastrophe really. Um, and they're very good at being resilient and resistant and then trying new things. Um, so that's just sort of one of the, the benefits of being an insect. 
Um, also, reasons for hope include what we know about birds, is that when we spend time and money uh, restoring areas such as the wetland shown at the bottom of the screen, we see actually an improvement in the number of species and the a number of individuals uh, in those habitats with birds. So when we are spend our, our money uh, and efforts restoring habitat, it can lead to, to pretty substantial improvements in those areas. So, you know, if you're comparing it to um, you know, like a grassland that would could, with a little bit of money, it could be a lot better. So what are the um, ways we're sort of limited right now is actually uh, data. Um, so to do a lot of this work in conservation, you need a lot of data specifically across large spatial scales. Um, and that'll tell you where things are, who are they with, what they're eating. Um, and one of the biggest constraints right now is just sort of the lack of um, observations or people uh, able to do this work. And so, you know, what's been really exciting in the realm of research where I've been working, which is in conservation and biodiversity, is there's been a lot of technology and this combination of technology and people that have really pushed the, the boundaries forward in terms of how much data we can get and what, at what scale. So like sensors and satellites have been huge for gathering environmental data and you know environmental data at a daily basis and at a very small ge uh, geographic scale. Um, drones, recent um, usage of drones has been really helpful for collecting more information on habitat data over broad geographic ranges. And of course, you and your smartphone have been instrumental in understanding where a lot of plants and animals are and who they're with. So I like to say it's a combination of a CPU, a, a compute processing unit with a human processing unit to enable to get us big data fast. Um, and so to those ends, community science really fits into this uh, and is in playing an important role in conservation. If we take a moment, um, just in the US alone, we have about a million people participating in what I would consider biodiversity community or citizen science every year. So, the, so that's a lot of people out there looking across landscapes for plants and animals. And I wanna say that, of course, there's the observing part we talked about, but community science also involves all aspects of the scientific process. And that includes creating questions, planning experiments and, and surveys, analyzing data, and then communicating it with others. And, and that's been really fun is to bring more people into the scientific process who normally aren't um, directly involved in it because it, it's, it's a rewarding sort of activity. And so even if you're not observing, there might be another component of this community science that, that floats your boat. Um, one thing I often get asked is, is it does, you know, what about the data for community science? And I think it's really been an interesting process um, because it's uh, focused our efforts into to evaluating our data quality, I think in new and exciting ways. And to those ends, it improved our research outcomes. Um, so, so community science actually has made us think about how we collect data, how we evaluate whether it's good or not um, at a scale that I don't think I was even prepared to think about. Um, and it's been really successful at that. And there have been evaluations of that data and saying that actually community science data is probably better than what we've collected in the past. And so that's exciting. Um, and, uh, and we're getting better at it all the time. Um, and what I love about uh, citizen science driven research is that it does seem to also be improving funding for conservation and restoration. So uh, we project what we we protect what we like, love and know. And as a result, you know, having more people involved in this process um, has increased that network and sort of increased pressure on various um, agencies to 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 spend more of their um, time and effort on these issues. So that's that's pretty exciting. Um, I think there are, you know, in my mind, there are four really important web-based uh, community science programs out there. And the one that Rebecca was talking about, iNaturalist is one. Um, 
a step back here just a moment. They're all web platforms. So, so basically thinking about how to collect data at scale. Um, they collect at different scales, but um, they're still at much larger scales than what we've been able to do in the past, which has been more at the like single lab level, or maybe you'd have a collaboration between two or four labs, but never really beyond that. These these web platforms are allowing us for you know thousands or if not millions of people to participate simultaneously in a very similar way, collecting very similar data that is then um, interoperable with, with a bunch of different systems. So that's kind of, that is absolutely really amazing. So, so not that they're not full of challenges, but, but it's still pretty friggin' cool. Um, and we've got four big ones. So we have iNaturalist, which Rebecca had talked about, which is the, the web platform that will be used for the City um, Nature Challenge. There's also um, at the University of Arizona, Nature's Notes book, which was used to be by the US Geological Survey, but it's now an independent entity. And it is a phenology or looking at the seasonality, such as when blooms or when fall. So changes in the season happen and when they're happening and how they might be changing due to climate change. Um, there is eBird, which is another really popular program which collects millions of observations globally. And then as um, Margaret mentioned, there's eButterfly, which is uh, officially through the Space for Life. And it is um, more focused on North America. So Nature's Notebook is US, eButterfly is North America, and then iNaturalist and eBird have global coverage. Um, what's really amazing, as I mentioned, is these programs are scalable and unified. So, so you have sort of these local, regional, and continental scales that all of them work at. Um, they have similar data collection methods and data fields. And these are helped by this unified database standard we call Darwin Core Standards, meaning to say that um, your data structure is in a way that you can share it between programs, which is pretty powerful. And so that way, uh, most of these data um, web platforms, these citizen science program actually push to a data warehouse called GBIF or the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which is a free service to everyone, uh, both in terms of as a as um, a data provider and organizer. So you can go and, and look at GBIF and download data from it. And there's lots of ways to do that, whether that's directly through their uh, graphic user interface or through an API um, as such as uh, using R or Python. So I really wanna take a moment to talk about the data that iNaturalist creates. So the iNaturalist creates the most data out of any of those community science programs. And um, that has to do with the kind of the type of data they're collecting. It's probably the sort of most pared down version of all of this. Um, and so what I love about iNaturalist though is it was really created to be more of a social media thing, creating community, but it's also creating data and from that data information. And one of the three of the really cool things that iNaturalist does, I think as a, as a platform is it has a human assisted identification coupled with computer assisted identification. Um, so you have a way in which uh, other people look at your photograph, uh, but then also there is a computer algorithm that uh, is using machine learning that can help identify that species. Um, another thing that iNaturalist can do is it can help you build field guides in a, one that is tailored to your specific school, for example, or place, whatever, backyard, whatever you want it to be. You can build field guides within the iNaturalist platform. And then um, it is a way to store visual, it creates data that can be stored, visualized, analyzed, and shared. Uh, so you can download directly from iNaturalist various types of data into like basically an Excel file or a flat file, a CSV, and then you can analyze and visualize it. So that's pretty cool. Um, okay, so, so what do you do when you do iNaturalist? Just to give you a brief overview, if you haven't done it, um, iNaturalist is similar to the other programs, but we're going to focus here on iNaturalist. So when you uh, do your observation, you're going to notify the iNaturalist web, um, um, either the browse uh, account or the, the smartphone um, uh, software that who you are, 
And so you'll have your personal uh, login information. You're gonna sh tell them what you saw. Um, and so that will usually be a picture that you will, uh, or like you'll, it'll be based on a picture that you're gonna submit. You'll tell them when you saw it. Uh, and so the day and time, which is often just automatically filled by your smartphone, uh, and then evidence of what you saw. So there'll be a photograph or sound um, that will be included with that. So you'll do who you are, what you saw, when you saw it, um, what it looks like, and then where you saw it. And that um, lat long is really important from a research perspective. Uh, and as GPS is getting better and better, it's, it's really accurate. I know I used iNaturalist recently to find a, um, a honeysuckle for a friend of mine. Uh, and I looked in the iNaturalist um, uh, observations just online and I was like, okay, it's up at the top of Mount Lemon near this trailhead. And I got the lat long and I went to that lat long exactly. And it was like two feet off. So that's pretty amazing, uh, that level of accuracy that we're able to, to replicate now or produce now. Um, once these observations are in the database, things happen. So you would submit your photo of this lovely lizard um, and then in the iNaturalist app, and then it goes to two different processes. One of them is a machine driven verification, which will give you a species that may or may not change what you think that is. Also other real humans will look at it and, and think about what that is. Uh, and verify that it is, you know, some fabulous species of Australian lizard, which I don't know, but it's pretty fabulous. Uh, and then that data, once it is verified by these multiple sources, gets pushed, uh, gets tagged, sorry, in the iNaturalist database as research grade. And then all research grade gets pushed to GBIF the, uh, um, or another database, this Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which is a big warehouse of all biodiversity data. So that's pretty fun. So in the, if you participate on iNaturalist, then your data is actually being pushed to a place where scientists use that data for various questions that they're asking. Um, cool. And then once it's in that GBIF database, where does it go? So it's usually combined with uh, sets of environmental data. Those could be temperature, it can be precipitation. There's all sorts of environmental data that's being collected by both satellites and on the ground sensors, or it can be combined with genetic data uh, about different organisms. And then um, it is analyzed for discovery and shared with conservation and management. And then sometimes there's this really fun little loop that's happening more and more, which is then um, once it's analyzed for discovery, sometimes uh, researchers will go back to the community scientists and be like, okay, like, uh, I think, you know, I made a model of where the species should be, but we don't have any records. Can you go ground truth this model for me? Meaning to say, can you go to this place and see if this bug or plant is there? Um, and then also, folks are even using it for entirely new projects and say, you know, we looked at all this data and we feel like, you know, this new invasive species is showing up. Can we go out as a group and look and see if that's true? So again, you, you know, sort of engaging community scientists in the scientific process in a much more active way. Um, I will say, you know, especially at, as things move from iNaturalist to GBIF, if you're gonna use that I, or GBIF, iNaturalist data that is in GBIF, there are some things you'll have to pay attention to. And these have to do with sort of <laughs> things that happen in computer sciences, science in general. Um, is integrating databases are um, really complicated. Specifically naming things is really, really difficult. Um, and they often they don't sometimes they don't share the same species names. So species A is called species B in in the different database, and sometimes the so the observations don't always line up. So you have to be really careful of that. Another place where uh, errors happen quite a bit is uh, georeferencing. So those latitude and longitude sites or um, fields have uh, can have really. Um, some challenges there that you have to be careful of. It's not the end of the world, you just have to be careful about it. Um, and so there are different standards that we, we pay attention to.
and different ways of checking that data. But you know, happy to talk more about that if you decide to use it in your class. Uh, nonetheless, all this data is creating this huge big data lake uh, and kind of a treasure trove for different things uh, in research and, and then management and, and policy. So certainly having a lot more data is increasing the rate of discovery. And I'm going to call out the Tumamak gold uh, glowberry, which is pictured here on the left. Uh, this is actually a picture that was um, taken by a citizen scientist. Uh, this plant had never been seen in Saguaro East, and a citizen scientist found it, posted it on Facebook, and uh, the park botanist saw it and got very excited. And so this was a discovery that was, you know, probably took years off of the discovery just because they don't have that much time for the botanists to run around and look at for things exhaustively. That now uh, the um, national park can can fold this into their conservation and management plan. Um, I will say that community science data is also changing actions uh, locally. It's been really important for the buffalo grass management in terms of being able to predict where buffalo grass is going to be greening. When buffalo grass greens is when you want to put apply an herbicide. The the um, for lack of a better word kill rate for buffalo grass when it's green is like almost above ninety percent. And so you really want to have that sort of um, precision in terms of your conservation. And it's really helps um, sort of uh, precisely um, apply pesticides or herbicides for maximum intent. So that's great. And then, you know, the participation of community science and the data they're creating is promotes faster and better conservation. Uh, right here, I've got an example of Ferris's copper, which is up in the White Mountains. Uh, those record, this species is under uh, what we call species status assessment for the Endangered Species Act. So this is the process before they decide whether to li list something as threatened or endangered. Um, it's been community scientists have been providing a lot of the data for this to help us understand what this butterfly is doing and what actions should be taken, if any, um, to help make sure that it, it's around for the next couple hundred years. So that's, those are all very exciting three exciting examples of, of how community science is, you know, making research better uh, and, and um, impacting the, the management and conservation of these, these plants and animals. Um, uh, to those ends even larger, uh, we have a couple local example, but, but more globally, it's, it's really important to remember that, you know, this is not a new concept. Community science, it, it extends back, you know, probably since we started forming civilizations. Um, uh, you know, professional scientists is, have only been around for a couple hundred years. But remember, when you're collecting records, you're building on an extensive history of lots of people collecting records and observations about the natural world. Uh, for example, here, you know, cherry blossoms have been recorded every year in Japan since, um, you know, early samurais. So you're looking at the 1100s. And so that's been a really, um, important example of how climate change is impacting uh, phenology or the rate of the spring bloom. Uh, it also helps define the present. Uh, community science has been really important for understanding things like wildfires and where animals are in particular and where they, they are moving to in real time as fires sweep through their environments. Uh, and then also it helps us predict the future. And this is, you know, always a tricky bit, as any weatherman will tell you. Uh, you know, and it's, you know, but we're getting, we're slowly getting better at it. And, uh, you know, knowing where, for this here, an example of an invasive species, the lionfish, which is invasive to um, the Caribbean, where it is and where it's moving in the next 10 years have been really important for, for various things, including management and conservation efforts. Uh, one of the best things, too, about um, community science is the data that it's making is really sort of a, 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 an entry point for teaching data science and providing um, sort of context for why you should lear learn a lot of these skills. Uh, certainly in ecology, big data is here between environmental data, genomic data, and, and community science data of observations. Um, and so having these professional skills of being able to deal with large data and make sense of it certainly expands how you do research, when we can do research, and who does research. 
Uh, and I know a lot of people to do this, you need to be a little bit more familiar with, with computer programming and co computational thinking. Um, and it is a little scary sometimes, but what I love about you know, the iNaturalist data is it, it seems to provide a great entry point for a lot of people. Um, and three ways that we're working on that uh, in, at the U of A in, in sort of the School of Natural Resources is I teach um, two different classes. One of them is at the freshman sophomore level. It's what we call a general education course. So across all majors and it's called Dealing with Data in the Wild. And it's sort of a riff off the movie slash book, The Martian, where um, you're gonna have to science the heck out of it um, as a through a variety of different scenarios that, that aren't, aren't, you know, are sort of uh, challenging. So in this, in this narrative, the students uh, go to Antarctica, they are on a research mission down in Antarctica and then stuff starts to go wrong and they have to use data science to sort of navigate their way out of it. Um, and so they learn a variety of different computational skills and ways of thinking to, you know, while also learning about penguins and leopard seals. So pretty fun stuff. And then another class we teach is, is more for more sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And that is a project-based class called Applied Data Science. And it is focused on ecology. In this case, it is working with US Fish and Wildlife as part of their species status assessment. So students create different um, distribution models of species that are related um, to the species in question, so, or under review. So for, in this case, we were looking at the monarch butterfly, but this, the students created maps for the milkweed species the monarch butterfly feeds on. And so they're gonna create uh, distributions of where they, the, the milkweeds are and where they might be in the future uh, in different climate scenarios. And then the third place we're using the iNaturalist data is for faculty training in terms of how to um, uh, teach faculty to, to appropriately um, use data science skills in their class and teach them to others. And we use iNaturalist data for, the, for that sort of training expertise or uh, exercises. So that's, that's kind of what we're doing. So we're, we're doing it, you know, to the non -major, we're using iNaturalist data to teach data science to non-majors, to majors, and then to also to faculty. So, you know, what I'm really excited about is that, you know, all these, um, activities in community science, such as iNaturalist, it's, it's really driving us to think more about precision conservation. Um, uh, you know, our do conservation dollars uh, are, not, are a limited resource and thinking about how to optimize those um, resources has been really important. And I think, you know, the data that's coming in through community science has, has given us new and more powerful tools to do that. Um, of course, it also gives us ways to ask research questions that we, we have never been able to ask, but ultimately it, it, we're linking, hopefully linking it to conservation and management decisions. Um, yeah, and so it's a fun time to be a data nerd. And I think that's it, yep. So I am happy to take questions. Let me see, are you guys, let me get you back onto like, I can see you. Aha, I'm gonna stop share so I can see everybody a little bit better. There we go. But I'm happy to go back to my, to my talk. Thank you so much, Katie. That was awesome. Um, do we have uh, any questions from any of the guests? You can either unmute and, and join a conversation or put your questions in the chat, either is great. I really love how um, you sort of brought it around the full circle of information from um, iNaturalist and how conservation organizations and groups might be actually coming back to the citizen scientists and asking them to ground truth things. Um, that was something I was not aware of and um, that's pretty exciting. Um, have you been involved with anything like that directly, Katie, like from your work? Or? Yeah, we've done that with one of the papers we published on the Eastern giant swallowtail. Mm -hmm. So we asked people to go out and look for things where we thought they would be, mm -hmm. and they were there. So that was exciting. Um, I think it's, you know, more broadly, people who work in, we're kind of like big data nerds is the problem. Um, so I think the missing piece that we're working on as a group is how do we 
make sure the community scientists feel valued and part of the process in, in a way that, that is meaningful and authentic. Um, so that's something that we've been working on instead, but it's, we always get distracted with trying to make the next cool toy, <laughs> which is partly us. <laughs> Peggy, you have a question? I just had a question when, um, with something like a pro, you know, a specific thing like the city nature challenge, um, is that information then I, um, helpful to people who are um, using the data when a lot of new people are starting it? Or is it just part of the value introducing people to the process? Well, I, I think, you know, getting that research grade classification is, is the key to all iNaturalist data. So if you've got that on your, your observation, then it's considered to be of the same grade as any other observation. Um, where I think, you know, we call it quality assurance, quality control for getting the right, basically identification with the photo, right? Mm -hmm. um, you'd be surprised when you go to museums, how challenging that is actually yeah. when you go and look at collection data. Oh yeah, that's fun. Um, so this is a long-term problem. This is not unique to, to iNaturalist. It's just the scale of the observations could be a problem, right? But what iNaturalist has is they have a series of checks to make sure that those are of high quality. So again, the um, AI, the artificial intelligence algorithm, what they've done is they've taken correctly identified photographs, usually by a suite of people who they know are really good at identifying. Um, and they use that as their training for the computer. And then the computer then through that magical algorithm uh, can help identify. So you've got that line of evidence, right? That is independent. But then you also have other people looking at this photograph. And for iNaturalist, it's a minimum of two people to verify that that species is that species. Here, there are other ways that kind of things get um, validated sort of intrinsically. If you get something rare, somebody else is going to go want to find it. It's sort of like Pokemon Go. Um, so, so there's that, that sort of competitive thing that also sort of helps to self-validate that. Um, I will say that different taxa are better than others. Um, you know, the world of parasitoid wasps may not be the best place to do this, but many of the things that people look at are pretty... Um, uh, how do I say this? It's sort of easy to discern versus, uh, I mean, most, most people aren't going to like hunt down the parasitoid wasps and take photos of them the first time out they tried iNaturalist, right? That's sort of, that's uber nerd over here. Um, so, so there's that. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think insects present a particular challenge with iNaturalist and, and actually are um, some of the organisms that are, in, in terms of how many surround us, I think they're probably the least included, right? Because they're hard to photograph. Many of them are small. Um, I, I can't really help myself, but share this one that I saw yesterday since you are a butterfly person. Oh yeah, I want to see it. Definitely, so. <laughs> I did this stuff text me. Oh, I, yeah. this is what the AI helped me identify it as. So I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. That is a nice, but, it looks like a um, geometric of some sort. Yeah. So this, this is a leaf of a chiltepine plant in yep. my garden. Yeah. And I just saw this outline on it. That looks so cool. Yeah. And that's a was, nice bug. Yeah. It was really fun. So, and that's a good one for AI actually because of the the contrast it has with the background right yeah so um, i always try to include a few photos so we get a little uh -huh. bit of the scale as well yeah and and how good was it what is it, what did everybody say so this well this is what the ai said and this was just yesterday okay. so it's still okay so it still needs ideas ID. so the geometric people haven't found you yet Nope. And that they was will. actually one question that I had is, it seems like, especially with things like the City Nature Challenge, where we're putting on, you know, thousands of observations in just a very short time, Yeah, there's, there's a week period afterwards for identifications to kind of catch up. But 
still, in order to get those research grade identifications, I think it takes a huge effort to really recruit people specifically just for the identification period. And so this being just our second year of organizing the City Nature Challenge, you know, we really focused on just getting people out, making observations and yep. getting people on iNaturalist. But we're realizing that you know, really the next big step is to get people involved in identification. So do you have any suggestions in terms of how to engage those experts that do know <laughs> a lot more than yeah, casual be, naturalists? It would be interesting to see if you can get a taxon breakdown to who's, who you're missing. Mm. So so that should, should guide to a little bit of this. But um, where I've had success, uh, so I did a bio blitz with Carrie Seltzer, like back in the day um, when she was first hired. So context for everybody, Carrie is like, the head of sort of outreach, I would say, for iNaturalist at this point. Okay. I can't remember her title, but but that's it's something like that. If you go to like people at iNat, she's like featured. Um, and so what she did is she she had a group of people like we sat down just sort of like a hackathon basically, and like pizza was provided and we went through a bunch of, of, of different things. Other places which might be interested is there are naturalist groups who might be depending, but they're based by taxon so, so you know, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, SIBA comes to mind, Southeastern Arizona Butterfly Association. Mm. Um, there's the cactus group or, you know, there's different groups there that might be helpful just to, you know, uh, also, I mean, if you can convince them is some of the ology courses on campus. I can imagine a world where where you could have an assignment or activity where they have to sit down for two hours, like a lab and just power through some of these things right and yeah. figure out, you know, and the reflection would be like, you know, what did people see what did you know what what do you think common mistakes were those sorts of things. Yeah, those are great ideas. Thank you. Um, so the Office of Sustainability might be another place to to sort of see if you can do an event through them because I know like that might be kind of fun for the students. Mm -hmm. And then a final thing, you ready for this? Yes. Is have it be an honors like for honors credit within a class. Yes. other yes yeah, so there's shorter life cycles help definitely um it also allows for faster evolution they're quick generation times so they're you know able to respond to to um we call selective pressure which is in this case maybe a large asteroid that you know blows stuff up um, <laughs> much faster than something like a human which takes you know 15 years to reach reproductive, viable reproductive age. So, so yeah, um, well, they take, you know, two weeks, maybe, maybe a little longer sometimes, but yeah. So those are, those are trade-offs there in terms of the chat. Yeah, no worries. I have a question about how to best use iNaturalist to provide meaningful data. So, I'm what I, I would call an opportunistic iNaturalist user, <laughs> meaning I see a cool little butterfly in my garden and I'm gonna take a picture of it and try to figure out what it is and put it on you know, my profile and stuff, um, which is very different than you know, choosing a particular species that I'm really gonna focus on. And I've seen that some people on iNaturalist are like, you know, this person has the most of whatever swallowtail butterfly pictures sure. on all of my naturalist, you know. So, so I guess my question is, um, is 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 the you know mile wide but <laughs> inch deep of what I do of just like oh that's cool let's take a picture and see what it is or do you find really meaningful data when people just have multiple entries so that you're seeing like 
you know, when do we start seeing certain butterflies and how long are they in an area and, you know, what different life cycles are we seeing them in? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, so there's a couple things buried in that, right? So, so when I think about iNaturalist data, I think, you know, it's best for certain types of research questions. Like I would not use it for looking at changes in abundance in a species. It's just not what it's going to be good at. Um, I'd use you know, other programs uh, to do that, um, like eBird or eButterfly. If I was looking for changes in when it comes out, I'd probably look at the NPN data, the Nature's Notebook data, because it's that's what it's designed to do. INAT, I would say its strength is just like lots of things and lots of people looking for them, right? And it's really easy to sort of get that photo and get it online and get it identified. Um, so I think of them as more of a scaled museum collection. So in the way that we use museum collections now for ecology and biodiversity, that's how I think, you know, we'll continue to use it. So I think it's perfectly fine that you're like, just, you know, getting, taking pictures of whatever catches your eye. That's great. I would say that, you know, one of the limits to all these citizen community science projects that, uh, richness, it could Yes, richness than abundance. Although there are like, if I'm looking at for richness in birds, I'm gonna go to eBird data before I go to iNaturalist data. And that just has to do with the data structure. We'll talk more about that, that's nerdy. But um, <laughs> for iNat, I would, you know, it's just like, I wanna know like, you know, uh, potentially what's going on just for like, what is catching people's eye? What are, what are people engaging with? What are, like what's living with humans basically uh, in a way that they're, they're, they're paying attention. That's what I think INAT data is good for. It's also good for what I do. So species distribution modeling, so observations. I think the limit to all of these programs, like I put a paper and one of, a link to a paper, if you guys wanna get on, where it really outlines what the limits to community science data is right, are right now. But one of them is our spatial sampling. So most community scientists don't travel farther than two hours from their house to make collections or make observations. So, so that spatial, like it's pretty focused around human settlements, which, you know, moving forward, uh, correct. iNaturalist is definitely great for the generalist. Well, like if you're a bird nerd, eBird is like the bomb. And it's also really helpful. Like the data is just better. We can do more with it because it's, we didn't talk about this, but eBird and eButterfly are what we call checklist data. And both those data entries, you're listing everything that you saw together and then identifying that, yes, I saw, you know, I'm reporting everything that I was able to see and identify. And so that creates this sort of linkage within the within the groups that you don't have with INAT, right? So INAT's just, it's, I saw this, which is great. Uh, very similar to museums. Um, so yeah, so I think, you know, just remember there are these limits to the data, but you know, the data is still pretty cool and it's, it's pretty useful for things in ways that like, and there's nothing else replacing it, right? There's nothing else available to it. So, so there's that. Um, and we'll probably get better at trying to get people out to different places, maybe with different activities or things like that, but, or we'll get better at estimating based on what we see here, what will be in that space next to us. Um, so we'll use the data itself to maybe help us estimate that better. Yeah. So you, you reminded me of uh, Rebecca and I had a little um, uh, professional development with teachers a couple weeks ago, and we talked about um, using iNaturalist um, as a tool in research. And one of the things that, um, that, that sort of you're alluding to is you can ask a lot of really interesting questions about people, <laughs> yeah. about communities and about about what, uh, you know, just like, like what you said, where people go, because, you know, it's kind of a question of, is that just where the animals are? Or is that really just where the people go and look and see the animals, right? And, and then you can kind of get, a, maybe compare cities and communities that have a lot of green space and a lot of uh, sort of natural environments versus those that do not. Um, and so you can kind of look at how, 
how people choose to create their community and where they spend time in their community. So it becomes a, a um, just a really interesting tool in that way, I think. So. Yeah, and I think, you know, in that is embedded sort of uh, the socioeconomics of it and mm -hmm. sort of the race of it, uh, you know, race is also playing a role. And I think it's, there's been some really interesting sort of um, outreach attempts or integrations with iNaturalists trying to get to new communities, uh, people of color, you know, uh, and doing it in different ways than like, oh, I saw this cool bug. It's maybe like something's eating my lettuce plants and I'm kind of upset about it, um, <laughs> which is fine, which is a great way to start thinking about this. Like we all engage with nature in slightly different ways and, and all of them have value. Um, there's lots of inroads into yeah. wanting to know what something is, you know? Right, exactly. Right. It is uh, those different ways to create that need to know, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's um, a really interesting um, database. I mean, and, and like the contrast you just created between like eBird and eButterfly. Um, yeah, which I don't know either of those very well. And and I'm just a very much a novice at um, iNaturalist too, but um really intrigued to explore it more and to encourage students and teachers to explore it more too. But, um, yeah, and I, you know, sometimes I, I think of iNaturalist as the place where you do a lot of introduction and show people the concepts and sort of like, it's a little bit, the interface is a little bit easier. It's a little bit um, more approachable, mm -hmm. uh, but eBird, like they're doing a great job too, making using technology to make birding more sort of accessible to a lot of people. Like Merlin just introduced basically the Shazam of bird sounds. So you can like just, you know, point oh, your phone at it, you know, exactly. And it'll tell you it's a house finch, right? Um, that's pretty amazing. So I needed that uh, yesterday. I heard somebody, I don't know who it was. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's probably mockingbirds. They're out. <laughs> trying all sorts of songs right now. Uh -huh. yeah. um, so I think, you know, that's what I'm really loving about sort of the technology intervent, uh, innovation right now. I will say that like certain taxa are just wealthier than other taxa um, and have always been wealthier and will continue to be so. So that's kind of fun. <laughs> so I feel like birding will, will have this, butterflies will have it for insects. We do better than most, but like, you know, rats are never going to have it. I'm, I'm sorry, rats. It's just not going to work for you. Um, so don't don't wait for iRat. It's probably not coming. <laughs> They're also the showy yeah, thing. Like birds and butterflies are are pretty, and people like right. Them. And it's sort of appealing to again appealing to our sensory yeah. you know biases. Right, we're like oh sparkly, colorful things. <laughs> yeah. Or bat, yeah, bats, things that are just hard to photograph. You're just not going to get it. Um, I you mentioned a paper, but I don't see it in the chat. Oh, can you let me? I'll sure put it in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I click everyone. Like Johnson, the one. Oh, yeah, the Johnson paper. Let's see yeah. where. Yeah, where did Johnson I put that? Johnson et al. 2022. Yeah, it just came out. Um, oh, but cool. I'll drop the full. That's great, Katie. Thank you. Just a few minutes. So I want to make sure if anybody else in our audience has any questions for Katie that, um, you know, we really give you that opportunity. Awesome. That's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Has anybody got butterfly pictures on their phone? I, I can I? <laughs> no, I just had a caterpillar the other day. <laughs> Oh, that, I shared right? you, that you have to come off. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A little fuzzy jobby. Yeah. Big old grub I, I found yesterday. <laughs> oh, in I, your compost? In my garden, yeah. Oh, uh, right. Which gets compost thrown in. So I I just if we have two seconds, I was, oh, wait, is there a new chat? No, that was okay. Yeah. Um I was talking with a, a young biologist yesterday who's very into this group of uh, miniature harvest men. So like related oh, to daddy, lang da daddy yeah. long legs, but yeah. these things are like, he was showing pictures. They were so very tiny. And one of them, the one that I was looking at, so I said, that looks just like a springtail. And it turns out that they 
that's what they feed on is springtails and they have this amazing but like here's somebody who's exploring a world that most people never see right exactly it's, it's in these tiny little um i learned a new term called meso meso voids i think and so medium spaces like medium small spaces in between rocks you know and i was like so like there's lots to explore out there is what i the take-home message from that that i wanted yeah to and what, what I love about the INAP platform is it brings people who like those things together, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you can find your community. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, the poor high school student Thanks. who loves the miniature harvest men, it's like probably all their friends are like, that's great, but. <laughs> yeah. but Peggy, Peggy, my master naturalist colleague on here, she and I have um, shared our love of Steve Jones, who's an mm -hmm. avid plant identifier. I love him. <laughs> yeah, I love him. Um, anyway, I wanted to I just show it. people because I, I know there are a few teachers here, and I just want to show them um, kind of the the cheap hack for <laughs> photographing insects. So that picture of the the butterfly that I had shared. So I take my very old cell phone here. And this is just a loop. It's a little magnifier. And all I do is put it in front of my camera uh -huh. to be able to magnify things. So you don't need a fancy camera with a macro lens to be able to get decent photos of insects or other small things. So you can get just little plastic magnifiers. This one has a few different pulled outs. We actually got these as gifts when we became master naturalists. Oh, so it's got a few <laughs> options. It's like, you know, instead of a pocket knife, it's got a pocket little loop set. Mm -hmm. um, she awesome. Yes, but I carry it everywhere, don't I? But anyway, I just, yeah, yeah I just wanted to point that out as something that's like really easy to do as you're thinking about interacting with a world that's a little smaller than our naked eye likes to take in mm -hmm. that's great Rebecca I don't know if you have any other cheap tips Katie on how to yeah and I've seen those like I've actually like put rubber bands around them so they just sort of and then it sort of like fixes on the foot like you can just slide it over the phone and then just that way you can okay. have both hands to operate the phone um I like that yeah. And they sell them now with rubber bands too. And they're like $3 or something, but they're, they work, you know, pretty well for what we're doing. Um, well, um, Katie, thank you so much for spending this hour with us and sharing uh, all your knowledge and enthusiasm for citizen science. Um, and thanks to all the folks who have joined us. And Rebecca, thank you so much for making this all happen. This was really your brainchild. And um, I think we should continue it into the future uh, each spring. And um, I think it will just grow. I think Arizona is a fabulous place to consider biodiversity. Um, and Tucson is a fabulous area for science. And we just want to keep it going and recruit more young scientists like the one on your shoulder. Um, and <laughs> Uh, I think the future looks bright in that regard. Yep. <laughs> so thank you all. And again, um, all three series will be available on the SARSEF uh, YouTube. Um, and um, good luck this weekend. Find lots of, uh, get lots of photos, upload them to iNaturalist. Remember, it starts, what, Friday and ends on? Yep. It's all day Friday through the entire day Monday. Monday. And I'll add that you don't have to join any special project, anything you put on iNaturalist. If you're in Pima County through Friday, beginning of the day, through Monday, end of the day, counts for the project. So no extra steps needed. That's fabulous. Well, thank you all and good luck. I hope we really rock the uh, City Nature Challenge. And also, I hope we get lots of citizen science data-based uh, projects in the uh, science fair next year. That would be fabulous. So thank you all. Thank you, Katie. Thanks, folks. Yeah.